I want to take just a little bit of time to discuss this one right here in the middle. So um, let's make some room. So, so with this, generally there's a hormone called DHT, dihydrotestosterone. And there are some drugs like minoxidil that are basically inhibitors or blockers of DHT. Um, DHT, excessive or aggressive quantities of DHT, are, are known for contributing to that, that hair recession, that early onset, early age hair recession. And so one of the biggest questions that I get, is especially from young men or from women who have the same type of, of uh, pattern baldness, is what can you do? What can you do to try to be as preventative as possible and, and slowing that down? Well, there are some studies that show that, that men um, some certain men with male pattern hair style or, or, or types of hair loss have a, an aggressive um, sensitivity to DHT because their hair follicles are more sensitive to oxidation. Uh, and so what that means is we're all exposed to oxidation on a, on a daily basis as part of being alive, but, but some people are, are more susceptible to it. And, and those individuals that are more susceptible generally have, have a tendency toward this type of hair loss pattern. And so there's some things that can be taken supplementally that can help with this. DHEA is one of them. Selenium. Pycnogenol. Some, uh, a lot of men specifically will take, um, will take um, the, the prostate support type supplements like pumpkin seed. Uh, some will take tribulus testeris uh, or saw palmetto. Um, but these are all things that are going to have an impact on, um, on this right here, that DHT. And so these are things that can be taken as a preventative if you're finding that that is occurring nutritionally, supplementally. Now, the other thing, um, it, a big one, one of the biggest ones here is zinc because you need zinc to properly metabolize DHT. And so what happens sometimes is DHT levels are too elevated, they're too high because a person's not breaking it down and that DHT then can create problems within the hair follicle itself and the hair growth and the receding pattern begins. And so one of the things that you can do, guys and ladies, is measure, have your doctor measure your DHT. So measure it and measure the zinc because a lot of times what you'll find is you'll find elevated DHT and low zinc. And if you see that pattern, this is where a lot of times zinc can be very, very helpful for that type of, um, that type of, of uh, hormone-related hair loss pattern. So I, I want, wanted to make sure I mentioned that because that's a, probably one of the more common questions online I get. Let's go back. I want to talk next a little bit about alopecia areata which is the autoimmune type of hair loss. Now, anybody with hair loss should have a comprehensive workup measuring your nutrients because, you know, the old adage is, there's an old saying, everybody is entitled to more than one problem. Like you might have an autoimmune hair loss, but you also might have a vitamin deficiency that's interfering with how your hair is capable of regrowing. It's just, just smart to measure all of that so that you don't like embark upon this diet change, but then you happen to be deficient in key nutrients and you're not getting them and so your hair's not growing back and then you get frustrated and then you quit the diet change. Sometimes you gotta make multiple changes in diet and lifestyle. Uh, but, but alopecia areata is an autoimmune process. Now I wanna share this little testimonial with you. This is one of our, one of our viewers wrote this, wrote in. He said, uh, rather she said, this is from Diane. I cannot tune in tonight, but I want to say one thing. I've had alopecia areata, again, this is autoimmune hair loss, since I was 35 um, years of age. This is 40 years ago because she's 75 now. And I've had patches of hair missing at least 25 times. I've been gluten-free for about eight years. So again, you know, wish you would have discovered this a long time ago, but gluten-free for eight years now and have not had any incidents of alopecia areata for the past five and a half years. There was one time six years ago that I did, but it was during a period when I also had a lot of stress. Remember what we were talking about earlier with, with stress being a trigger. 
can be a trigger. So in her case, it was moving, she broke an arm, and she lost a, a, a precious pet uh, and had lightning strike her house. That's a really bad course of bad luck all the way around. Anyway, so that could have brought it on, not could have, it probably did bring it on, Diane. But am I not losing hair now because I'm not eating gluten? Yes, that is correct. I don't know, but not having this type of autoimmune hair loss now is definitely enough to keep me gluten-free. So again, this is just somebody's, uh, somebody, is, their story about going gluten-free, again, hair loss, their, you know, the vast majority of their entire life, eight years on a gluten-free diet, no more hair loss. Now, I see this all the time, and it, you know, it's really a tragedy, and it's a travesty, because if you have alopecia areata, right, this, again, this is the autoimmune uh, condition where your body is attacking your hair follicles, destroying them and creating a baldness. What is the treatment for alopecia areata? Any guesses? First person that guesses the treatment right, we're going to give away a gift bag. We're going to give away one of our, our new gluten-free gift bags. So um, let's just give you guys a minute to figure that one out. And Mel, get me the first person who gets the, gets, uh, gets the answer right. right. Um, but we'll come back to that. Because what I, what I wanna show you too is a, another case study. And I've, I've seen, you know, a hundred or so of these cases over the past 20 years of the impact of gluten on hair growth. So this is a particular case. This is a woman that came to see me Oh, it's, it's been a number of years now, but um, in this particular case on her initial visit, what you're looking at here is, is what alopecia areata looks like. If you'll notice the area where there's hair loss, there's zero hair growth in this section. It's smooth. If you were to touch it, it would feel like baby skin. It's so soft and smooth. This is complete loss of hair growth in that area because of an autoimmune attack on the hair follicle itself. Now, on her initial visit, you know, we worked her up. She's gluten sensitive, right? She had gluten sensitive gene pattern. She was what we would call homozygous on the beta one gene. And so that was one of the big things that we found, but it wasn't the only thing that we found. She was also deficient in selenium and I believe zinc, B vitamins, so um, there were several different things going on in her pattern. So you know, we found all this out initially, and what do we do, right? We, we got her supplemented properly, the right doses, very important. Uh, because most people do this type of stuff and they don't, they don't take the right amount. And so it, it, kind of what they're doing, it's like peeing on a forest fire. They, they, they don't, they're not effective. Um, in her case, the diet change was very important. And so you can see you know, as so we move five months into that, into the future, look at the regrowth coming back. So you can see a lot of what was, what was patchy is now starting to come back in. Okay. Coming back in and then fast forward five more months. And you can see now no hair loss. It's completely normal, thick head of hair. This woman had a beautiful head of hair. Uh, by the time we were done, this is just, one area on the scalp, on the head, that I'm showing you in this picture. Um, so again, hair loss progressing to hair loss recovering. And a big part of this is gluten. Now, I probably in my own personal archive of cases have more, and I, I haven't published them yet. We're, we're, when I retire one of these days, when I, when I quit preparing for shows for you guys, I'll probably spend some time publishing all the case studies that I have on gluten-induced hair loss and alopecia areata. But currently today in the medical literature, there are about a couple of, only about two case reports of alopecia areata completely recovering going on a gluten-free diet. I've got a, probably close to 100 just in my, in my private practice over the last 21 years. So I know firsthand there is a serious connection. We also know, remember, the triggers of autoimmune disease. What are they? This is autoimmune disease. It's not different than any others. What are the triggers? There's four of them. Food can be a trigger. Chemical exposures can be a trigger. Nutritional deficiency can be a trigger. And microbial imbalance can be a trigger. And this particular woman had, had 
two of those categories. She had food as a category and she had nutritional deficiency as a category. Both those things were, were contributing to and triggering her, her illness. And so by changing her diet and by getting some good solid nutrition, she was able to overcome that. And I'm gonna come back to the question. Did we get any, any takers on the question? for the mainstream medical treatment of alopecia areata. Okay, looks like Diana uh, Krugel, I'm gonna mangle your name, so I apologize in advance. Uh, Zent, 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 Zentkowski, I don't know if I said that right. Um, but steroids, correct answer. Uh, that is the mainstream medical treatment for alopecia areata. It's actually steroid injections into the scalp direct, directly. So they take a big needle and they just inject it into the bald spots to try to see if they can calm down the inflammation. Remember, this is an inflammation. That's why they use steroids, because it's a disease caused by inflammation. Well, where's the inflammation coming from? It's coming from your diet. Right? And hair grows from the inside out. It doesn't grow from the outside in. So injecting a steroid to, to block inflammation is not going to lead to resolution. It'll hurt you. It'll hurt your scalp. And, the, and taking the steroids, remember what I, what I said earlier, is that if, if, if we're trying to treat the hair loss with a steroid, right? But the steroid is one of those things that can actually cause hair loss. Does that make sense to you? That's medicine today for a lot of people is, is what's actually being done to treat different things doesn't make a lot of sense because it, one, it doesn't, doctors aren't asking why the problem exists in the first place. They're just medicating the symptoms of the problem. And that's not, that's not a solution. That's a, what I like to call a pseudo solution. So um, anyway, the alopecia areata, hands down, I've seen so many cases of that go away completely with a change in diet. Very, very important that you understand that because if you have alopecia areata, if you've got patch-like hair loss on your scalp and you don't know why and you're looking down the barrel of a needle because they wanna inject you know, five shots of steroids into your scalp today and it's not working and you're at your wit's end and you, you're struggling and you know, losing your hair, now, you're, now what do you got? What are your other options? You can try rubbing minoxidil on, on the scalp. It's not gonna do much. Um, you can go buy a hairpiece, um, but you know that's that's not going to do much either, other than hide it. And now the hairpiece, just depending on what kind you buy, maybe there's chemicals and dyes all over that, and so that's not going to be helpful uh, either. So again, don't wait till it's too late, because I have seen cases of full-blown, you know, alopecia um, where it's been, you know, full where a person's been fully bald for, you know, a decade, we're probably not going to bring those hair follicles back to life. But if you catch it early enough with diet change, the sky's the limit in my experience and what I've seen people do with diet change and their hair. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.